This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Antichrist by Friedrich Nietzsche. Sections 20 through 26. Section 20. In my condemnation of Christianity, I surely hope I do no injustice to a related religion with an even larger number of believers. I allude to Buddhism. Both are to be reckoned among the nihilistic religions. They are both decadence religions, but they are separated from each other in a very remarkable way. For the fact that he is able to compare them at all, the critic of Christianity is indebted to the scholars of India. Buddhism is a hundred times as realistic as Christianity. It is part of its living heritage that it is able to face problems objectively and coolly. It is the product of long centuries of philosophical speculation. The concept God was already disposed of before it appeared. Buddhism is the only genuinely positive religion to be encountered in history, and this applies even to its epistemology, which is a strict phenomenalism. It does not speak of a struggle with sin, but yielding to reality, of the struggle with suffering. Sharply differentiating itself from Christianity, it puts the self-deception that lies in moral concepts behind it. It is, in my phrase, beyond good and evil. The two physiological facts upon which it grounds itself, and upon which it bestows its chief attention, are, first, an excessive sensitiveness to sensation, which manifests itself as a refined susceptibility to pain, and, secondly, an extraordinary spirituality, a too protracted concern with concepts and logical procedures, under the influence of which the instinct of personality has yielded to a notion of the impersonal. Both of these states will be familiar to a few of my readers, the objectivists, by experience, as they are to me. These physiological states produced a depression, and Buddha tried to combat it by hygienic measures. Against it he prescribed a life in the open, a life of travel, moderation in eating, and a careful selection of foods, caution in the use of intoxicants, the same caution in arousing any of the passions that foster a bilious habit and heat the blood. Finally, no worry, either on one's own account or on the account of others. He encourages ideas that make for either quiet contentment or good cheer. He finds means to combat ideas of other sorts— he understands good, the state of goodness, as something which promotes health. Prayer is not included, and neither is asceticism. There is no categorical imperative, nor any disciplines, even within the walls of a monastery. It is always possible to leave. These things would have been simply means of increasing the excessive sensitiveness above mentioned. For the same reason he does not advocate any conflict with unbelievers. His teaching is antagonistic to nothing so much as revenge, aversion, resentment, enmity never brings an end to enmity, the moving refrain of all Buddhism. And in all this he was right, for it is precisely these passions which, in view of his main regiminal purpose, are unhealthful. The mental fatigue that he observes, already plainly displayed in too much objectivity, that is, in the individual's loss of interest in himself, in loss of balance and of egoism, he combats by strong efforts to lead even the spiritual interests back to the ego. In Buddha's teaching, egoism is a duty. The one thing needful, the question how you can be delivered from suffering, regulates and determines the whole spiritual diet. Perhaps one will here recall that Athenian who also declared war on pure scientificality, to wit Socrates, who also elevated egoism to the estate of a morality. Section 21 The things necessary to Buddhism are a very mild climate, customs of great gentleness and liberality, and no militarism. Moreover, it must get its start among the higher and better educated classes. Cheerfulness, quiet, and the absence of desire are the chief desiderata, and they are attained. Buddhism is not a religion in which perfection is merely an object of aspiration, Perfection is actually normal. Under Christianity, the instincts of the subjugated and the oppressed come to the fore. It is only those who are at the bottom who seek their salvation in it. Here, the prevailing pastime, the favorite remedy for boredom, is the discussion of sin, self-criticism, the inquisition of conscience. Here, the emotion produced by power, called God, is pumped up by prayer. Here, the highest good is regarded as unattainable, as a gift, as grace. Here, too, open dealing is lacking. Concealment and the darkened room are Christian. Here, body is despised and hygiene is denounced as sensual. The church even ranges itself against cleanliness. The first Christian order after the banishment of the Moors closed the public baths, of which there were 270 in Cordoba alone. Christian, too, is a certain cruelty toward oneself and toward others, hatred of unbelievers, the will to persecute. Somber and disquieting ideas are in the foreground. The most esteemed states of mind, bearing the most respectable names, are epileptoid. The diet is so regulated as to engender morbid symptoms and overstimulate the nerves. 
Christian again is all deadly enmity to the rulers of the earth, to the aristocratic, along with a sort of secret rivalry with them. One resigns one's body to them. One wants only one's soul. And Christian is all hatred of the intellect, of pride, of courage, of freedom, of intellectual libertinage. Christian is all hatred of the senses, of joy in the senses, of joy in general. Section 22 when Christianity departed from its native soil, that of the lowest orders, the underworld of the ancient world, and began seeking power among barbarian peoples, it no longer had to deal with exhausted men, but with men still inwardly savage and capable of self-torture, in brief, strong men, but bungled men. Here, unlike in the case of the Buddhists, the cause of discontent with self, suffering through self, is not merely a general sensitiveness and susceptibility to pain, but on the contrary, an inordinate thirst for inflicting pain on others, a tendency to obtain subjective satisfaction in hostile deeds and ideas. Christianity had to embrace barbaric concepts and valuations, in order to obtain mastery over barbarians. Of such sort, for example, are the sacrifices of the firstborn, the drinking of blood as a sacrament, the disdain of the intellect and of culture, torture in all its forms, whether bodily or not, the whole pomp of the cult. Buddhism is a religion for peoples in a further state of development, for races that have become kind, gentle, and over-spiritualized. Europe is not yet ripe for it. It is a summons that takes them back to peace and cheerfulness, to a careful rationing of the spirit, to a certain hardening of the body. Christianity aims at mastering beasts of prey. Its modus operandi is to make them ill. To make feeble is the Christian recipe for taming, for civilizing. Buddhism is a religion for the closing, over-wearied stages of civilization— Christianity appears before civilization has so much as begun. Under certain circumstances, it lays the very foundations thereof. Section 23 Buddhism, I repeat, is a hundred times more austere, more honest, more objective. It no longer has to justify its pains, its susceptibility to suffering, by interpreting these things in terms of sin. It simply says, as it simply thinks, I suffer. To the barbarian, however, suffering in itself is scarcely understandable. What he needs, first of all, is an explanation as to why he suffers. His mere instinct prompts him to deny his suffering altogether, or to endure it in silence. Here the word devil was a blessing. Man had to have an omnipotent and terrible enemy. There was no need to be ashamed of suffering at the hands of such an enemy. At the bottom of Christianity there are several subtleties that belong to the Orient. In the first place— it knows that it is of very little consequence whether a thing be true or not, so long as it is believed to be true. Truth and faith. Here we have two wholly distinct worlds of ideas, almost two diametrically opposite worlds. The road to the one and the road to the other lie miles apart. To understand that fact thoroughly, this is almost enough in the Orient to make one a sage. The Brahmins knew it. Plato knew it. Every student of the esoteric knows it. When, for example, a man gets any pleasure out of the notion that he has been saved from sin, it is not necessary for him to be actually sinful, but merely to feel sinful. But when faith is thus exalted above everything else, it necessarily follows that reason, knowledge, and patient enquiry have to be discredited. The road to the truth becomes a forbidden road. Hope, in its stronger forms, is a great deal more powerful stimulants to life than any sort of realized joy can ever be. Man must be sustained in suffering, by a hope so high that no conflict with actuality can dash it, so high indeed that no fulfillment can satisfy it, a hope reaching out beyond this world. Precisely because of this power that hope has of making the suffering hold out, the Greeks regarded it as the evil of evils, as the most malign of evils. It remained behind at the source of all evil, that is, in Pandora's box. In order that love may be possible, God must become a person. In order that the lower instincts may take a hand in the matter, God must be young, to satisfy the ardor of the woman, a beautiful saint must appear on the scene, and to satisfy that of the men there must be a virgin. These things are necessary if Christianity is to assume lordship over a soil on which some aphrodisiacal or Adonis cult has already established a notion as to what a cult ought to be. To insist upon chastity greatly strengthens the vehemence and subjectivity of the religious instinct. It makes the cult warmer, more enthusiastic, more soulful. Love is the state in which man sees things most decidedly as they are not. The force of illusion reaches its highest here and so does the capacity for sweetening, for transfiguring. When a man is in love, he endures more than at any other time. He submits to anything. The problem was to devise a religion which would allow one to love. By this means, the worst that life has to offer is overcome. It is scarcely even noticed. So much for the three Christian virtues, faith, hope, and charity. I call them the three Christian ingenuities. Buddhism is in too late a stage of development, too full of positivism, to be shrewd in any such way. 
Section 24 Here I barely touch on the problem of the origin of Christianity. The first thing necessary to its solution is this, that Christianity is to be understood only by examining the soil from which it sprung. It is not a reaction against Jewish instincts. It is their inevitable product. It is simply one more step in the awe-inspiring logic of the Jews. In the words of the Saviour, salvation is of the Jews. The second thing to remember is this, that the psychological type of the Galilean is still to be recognized. But it was only in its most degenerate form, which is at once maimed and overladen with foreign features, that it could serve in the manner in which it has been used, as a type of the Saviour of mankind. The Jews are the most remarkable people in the history of the world, for when they were confronted with the question, to be or not to be, they chose, with perfectly unearthly deliberation, to be at any price. This price involved a radical falsification of all nature, of all naturalness, of all reality, of the whole inner world, as well as of the outer. They put themselves against all those conditions under which hitherto a people had been able to live, or had even been permitted to live. Out of themselves they evolved an idea which stood in direct opposition to natural conditions. One by one they distorted religion, civilization, morality, history, and psychology, until each became a contradiction of its natural significance. We meet with the same phenomenon later on, in an incalculably exaggerated form, but only as a copy. The Christian Church, put beside the people of God, shows a complete lack of any claim to originality. Precisely for this reason the Jews are the most fateful people in the history of the world. Their influence has so falsified the reasoning of mankind in this matter, that today the Christian can cherish anti-Semitism, without realizing that it is no more than the final consequence of Judaism. In my genealogy of morals I give the first psychological explanation of the concepts underlying these two antithetical things, a noble morality and a resentment morality, the second of which is a mere product of the denial of the former. The Judeo-Christian moral system belongs to the second division, and in every detail. In order to be able to say nay to everything representing an ascending evolution of life, that is, to well-being, to power, to beauty, to self-approval, the instincts of resentment, here become downright genius, had to invent another world, in which the acceptance of life appeared as the most evil and abominable thing imaginable. Psychologically, the Jews are a people gifted with the very strongest vitality, so much so that when they found themselves facing impossible conditions of life, they chose voluntarily, and with a profound talent for self-preservation, the side of all those instincts which make for decadence, not as if mastered by them, but as if detecting in them a power by which the world could be defied. The Jews are the very opposite of decadence. They have simply been forced into appearing in that guise, and with a degree of skill approaching the non plus ultra of histrionic genius, they have managed to put themselves at the head of all decadent movements, for example the Christianity of Paul, and so make of them something stronger than any party frankly saying yes to life, to the sort of men who reach out for power under Judaism and Christianity, that is to say, to the priestly class. Decadence is no more than a means to an end. Men of this sort have a vital interest in making mankind sick, and in confusing the values of good and bad, true and false, in a manner that is not only dangerous to life, but also slanders it. Section 25. The history of Israel is invaluable, as a typical history of an attempt to denaturize all natural values. I point to five facts which bear this out. Originally, and above all in the time of the monarchy, Israel maintained the right attitude of things, which is to say the natural attitude. Its Yahweh was an expression of its consciousness of power, its joy in itself, its hopes for itself. To him the Jews looked for victory and salvation, and through him they expected nature to give them whatever was necessary to their existence, above all, rain. Yahweh is the God of Israel, and consequently the God of justice. This is the logic of every race that has power in its hands, and a good conscience in the use of it. In the religious ceremonial of the Jews both aspects of this self-approval stand revealed. The nation is grateful for the high destiny that has enabled it to obtain dominion. It is grateful for the benign procession of the seasons, and for the good fortune attending its herds and crops. This view of things remained an ideal for a long while, even after it had been robbed of validity by tragic blows, anarchy within, and the Assyrian without. But the people still retained, as a projection of their highest yearnings, that vision of a king who was at once a gallant warrior and an upright judge, a vision best visualized in the typical prophet, i.e. critic and satirist of the moment, Isaiah. But every hope remained unfulfilled. The old god no longer could do what he used to do. He ought to have been abandoned. But what actually happened? Simply this. The conception of him was changed. The conception of him was denaturized. That was the price that had to be paid for keeping him. Yahweh, the god of justice, he is in accord with Israel no more. He no longer visualizes the national egoism. He is now a god only conditionally. 
the public notion of this god becomes merely a weapon in the hands of clerical agitators, who interpret all happiness as a reward, and all unhappiness as a punishment for obedience or disobedience to him, for sin, that most fraudulent of all imaginable interpretations, whereby a moral order of the world is set up, and the fundamental concepts, cause and effect, are stood on their heads, once natural causation has been swept out of the world by the doctrines of reward and punishment, some sort of unnatural causation becomes necessary, and all other varieties of the denial of nature follow it. A god who demands, in place of a god who helps, who gives counsel, who is at bottom merely a name for every happy inspiration of courage and self-reliance, morality is no longer a reflection of the conditions which make for the sound life and development of the people. It is no longer the primary life instinct. Instead, it has become abstract and in opposition to life a fundamental perversion of the fancy, an evil eye on all things. What is Jewish? What is Christian morality? Chance robbed of its innocence. Unhappiness polluted with the idea of sin. Well-being represented as danger, as temptation, a physiological disorder produced by the cankerworm of conscience. Section 26 The concept of God falsified. The concept of morality falsified. But even here Jewish priestcraft did not stop. The whole history of Israel ceased to be of any value. Out with it! These priests accomplished that miracle of falsification, of which a great part of the Bible is the documentary evidence, with a degree of contempt unparalleled, and in the face of all tradition and all historical reality, they translated the past of their people into religious terms, which is to say, they converted it into an idiotic mechanism of salvation, whereby all offenses against Yahweh were punished, and all devotion to Him was rewarded. We would regard this act of historical falsification as something far more shameful if familiarity with the ecclesiastical interpretation of history for thousands of years had not blunted our inclinations for uprightness in historicis. And the philosophers support the Church. The lie about a moral order of the world runs through the whole of philosophy, even the newest. What is the meaning of a moral order of the world? That there is a thing called the will of God, which once and for all time determines what man ought to do and what he ought not to do. That the worth of a people, or of an individual thereof, is to be measured by the extent to which they or he obey this will of God. That the destinies of a people, or of an individual, are controlled by this will of God, which rewards or punishes according to the degree of obedience manifested. In place of all that pitiful lie, reality has this to say. The priest a parasitical variety of man, who can exist only at the cost of every sound view of life, takes the name of God in vain. He calls that state of human society in which he himself determines the value of all things the kingdom of God. He calls the means whereby that state of affairs is attained the will of God. With cold-blooded cynicism he estimates all people, all ages, and all individuals by the extent of their subservience or opposition to the power of the priestly order. One observes him at work. Under the hand of the Jewish priesthood, the great age of Israel became an age of decline. The exile, with its long series of misfortunes, was transformed into a punishment for that great age, during which priests had not yet come into existence. Out of the powerful and wholly free heroes of Israel's history, they fashioned, according to their changing needs, either wretched bigots and hypocrites, or men entirely godless. They reduced every great event to the idiotic formula, obedient or disobedient to God. They went a step further the will of God, in other words, some means necessary for preserving the power of the priests, had to be determined, and to this end they had to have a revelation. In plain English, a gigantic literary fraud had to be perpetrated, and holy scriptures had to be concocted. And so, with utmost hierarchical pomp, and days of penance and much lamentation over the long days of sin now ended, they were duly published. The will of God, it appears, had long stood like a rock. The trouble was that mankind had neglected the holy scriptures. But the will of God had already been revealed to Moses. What happened? Simply this. The priest had formulated, once and for all time, and with the strictest meticulousness, what tithes were be paid to him, from the largest to the smallest, not forgetting the most appetizing cuts of meat, for the priest is a great consumer of beefsteaks. In brief, he let it be known just what he wanted, what the will of God was. From this time forward, things were so arranged that the priest became indispensable everywhere, at all the great natural events of life, at birth, at marriage, in sickness, at death, not to say at the sacrifice, that is, at meal-times, the holy parasite put in his appearance, and proceeded to denaturize it, in his own phrase, to sanctify it. For this should be noted, that every natural habit, every natural institution, the state, the administration of justice, marriage, the care of the sick and of the poor, everything demanded by the life instinct, in short, everything that has any value in itself, is reduced to absolute worthlessness, and even made the reverse of valuable by the parasitism of priests, or, if you choose, 
by the moral order of the world. The fact requires a sanction. A power to grant values becomes necessary, and the only way it can create such values is by denying nature. The priest depreciates and desecrates nature. It is only at this price that he can exist at all. Disobedience to God, which actually means to the priest, to the law, now gets the name of sin. The means prescribed for reconciliation with God are, of course, precisely the means which bring one most effectively under the thumb of the priest. He alone can save. Psychologically considered, sins are indispensable to every society organized on an ecclesiastical basis. They are the only reliable weapons of power. The priest lives upon sins. It is necessary to him that there be sinning. Prime axiom, God forgiveth him that repenteth. In plain English, him that submitteth to the priest. End of sections 20 through 26